John Vitipolitan, thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And um, let me make a big announcement tonight. A verdict has been reached already on TikTok and social media in Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. It's an all overwhelming verdict that Amber Heard is not telling the truth, that she is lying. That's what folks are saying. I mean, you've seen it. You may have written some of it yourself, as a matter of fact. Um, but it's really, um, I would say, unprecedented, but it's not unprecedented. I've seen a reaction like this before in cases that I've covered, where um, the, the, the reaction on social media has been extremely one-sided. The last time in a big, big case like this, this social media explosion was Jody Arias. And in that case, that overwhelming response of people watching and listening, social media got it right. They absolutely got it right. Jody Arias was convicted of the murder, and from the moment she opened her mouth on the witness stand to 17 days later when she finally closed it, uh, the, the response was overwhelmingly, Jody Arias is guilty. Jody Arias is lying on the witness stand. We can tell. Her lips are moving. Um, that's what happened in that case. But let me tell you, social media is not always in sync with the jury inside a courtroom. There's another case, not going to mention it, not going to put her picture up, not going to give her any publicity tonight. But you know which one I'm talking about. It happened before Jody Arias, happened after O.J. Simpson, happened down in Florida. There was a little girl who went missing. Her mom never reported it. Her mom ended up facing the death penalty for the murder of that little girl. And overwhelmingly, the response on sh social media and the folks who showed up at the courthouse was, this woman is guilty. Uh, that woman never testified, though, so we never really evaluated um, her, her testimony, but we did evaluate all the other lies that she told to police, investigators, her mother, and everyone else. But in that case, the jury saw it one way, social media saw it another way. Back to Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Someone is, is not telling the truth. I mean, which of these two is, I mean, both of, uh, of their testimony is just unbelievable what we're seeing, but someone is not believable. And, and you know, the jury has to figure it out. That's their job. And, and they will, at some point, render their verdict on which of these two they do not believe. But tonight, here on Closing Arguments, we're gonna bring in um, our own guests, our own deception detectors, who will, based upon their experience, their vast experience, take a look, take a listen to what Amber Heard is saying, what Johnny Depp is saying, and tonight give us their opinions about what is happening on that witness stand and what is happening inside that courtroom in Fairfax County, Virginia. Joining us tonight, first in Orlando, Florida, jury consultant, human behavior expert, Susan Constantine. In Loveland, Colorado, statement analyst expert, Lieutenant Robert Schaefer. And in Bradenton, Florida, voice stress analysis expert, Jerry Crotty. Welcome to you all. I know you all know each other very well. Uh, glad to have you here. We've got a, I don't know if this is gonna be easy. I don't know if this is going to be difficult, but l <laughs> let's get to work. Um, let's begin with Amber Heard, and this is really one of the moments everyone is talking about. It's where she's accusing Johnny Depp, her husband, of sexually assaulting her with a bottle. Let's watch, and then when we come back, I want to hear what everyone has to say about what we just heard. I couldn't... I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get through to him. I couldn't... I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up. And I don't know how that ended. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know what happened next. I don't understand. I, 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 when I... The, the next thing I remember, I was bent over um, backwards on the bar, meaning my chest was up. 
I was staring at the blue lights and my chest was on this, my back was on the countertops. And I thought he was punching me. I thought he was, I'm sorry. He was, his, I felt this pressure, I felt this pressure. He on my pubic bone and I, he thought he was, he thought he was punching me. I just saw his arm, I could feel his arm moving and I, it looked like he was punching me. But I could just feel this pressure. It was like, if it kept hitting, it didn't feel pain. It was just a pressure on my pubic bone. And I don't know. I, I don't remember what I said. I just remember being really still, not wanting to move. I remember looking around the room. I remember looking at all the broken bottles, broken glass. And I remember that it's just not wanting to move because I didn't know if it was broken. I didn't know if the bottle that he had inside me was broken. Such an important moment in this trial. Um, ladies first, Susan, go ahead. Tell me um, what you've noticed, yeah. what you picked up there, and, and what you're detecting. Yes, but first of all, like I, I want to preface that to all those out there that have been victims of domestic violence, I hope that this does not cause any triggers for you. So we are not here to cast blame, but rather to get down to the facts and evaluate the truthfulness of these statements. So when I'm watching the body language of Amber Heard telling the story, I want to share with you a little background here. First of all, I watched her through the entire trial, and here are the standouts. First, I don't generally see her crying. There's, she tends to be more histrionic and when she's sharing things. Usually emotion, especially when somebody's been victimized, happens at the end, not so much during this entire process. It seems to be on one speed. So when you're watching her, when I'm watching her body language, her expressions are very extreme and animated. And that seems to stand out throughout the entire process. Or she's telling this story. So when she's talking about what that she was on her back and she's looking up, you would assume that she would motion herself back. She would push her chest up because she's saying her chest was up and the light was coming down. The blue light was. The, what's happening is is that her gestures and her movements are not congruent with her words. And I often see this with Amber Heard throughout this testimony. So her face gets very uh, flushed when she's talking about, is kind of hyping herself up again, the lack of gesturing on point. And also too, is that she can't seem to remember. And there's another point where she's talking about, she's shaking her head no. So a lot of what she's talking about is incongruent. So at this point, I'm not believing that this actually, actually, excuse me, this actually occurred the way she says it did. Lieutenant Robert Schaefer, a statement analysis expert. What are your thoughts about um, what she's saying here about this bottle and the sexual assault? Well, thanks for having me. I um, have the luxury of not having to watch Amber Heard. Uh, I simply listen to what she has to say. So where Susan uh, looks at body language, I strictly look at what words are coming out of her mouth and what do those words mean? I, uh, she has a tendency to uh, abandon information, which means she'll start a thought and then 
not finish it and then begin a second thought. So she catches herself uh, seemingly about to say something and then realizes, oh, I better not say that. I don't want somebody to know that. It doesn't serve my purpose and abandon that, uh, abandons that thought and goes to a different one. And she does that on a fairly regular basis. Uh, one thing about the content of her story is that uh, she's describing an event that took a pretty significant period of time. And if you think about it, uh, let's just say it's five, 10 minutes, maybe it's longer, but uh, something is going to be said during that conversation or during that event. And she offers no verbal uh, or description of any verbal interaction between she and, and Mr. Depp. Uh, there's, there's definitely information missing from her story. There is, uh, again, it's a, more of a technicality, but she does offer some of the information uh, in this portion of her story in what we call passive language. And passive language is telling a story in such a way that it doesn't, uh, as though something happened all by itself. There's no cause of the action. And uh, in the statement analysis, uh, analysis world, that equates to uh, a significant degree of deception, trying to uh, uh, either conceal someone's identity or a serious lack of commitment to the information that they're offering. So across the board, when I, uh, if you want to say score her out on this uh, piece of testimony, I'd have to say that her intent is to mislead the listener. That's not to say something didn't happen. Uh, I feel very confident this is based in an event that actually happened, but it is not, uh, it, it didn't happen the way that she said. She's intending to mislead the listener. Jerry Crotty, voice stress analyst expert, your thoughts about what we just uh, uh, saw and heard. So uh, I use the computer voice stress analyzer in order to capture the voice to see if there's any uh, stress that's associated with deception. Uh, because she is crying so much and obviously her voice is very distorted, I wasn't able to capture uh, any patterns from this particular clip. Gotcha. Well, we have a, another shorter clip, and, and Lieutenant, this may um, add to your analysis because Amber Heard here is quoting what Johnny Depp is saying during this alleged attack. So let's take a listen to this uh, shorter clip. Do you recall what Mr. Depp was saying to you when he had the bottle and was pushing it against your pubic bone? He said, I'd, um, uh, that he kill me. So I'll kill you. He said it to me over and over again. He said, I'll fing kill you. Lieutenant, anything there add to your analysis of, of her description of the event? Uh, not in terms of the language that she used, but she is inconsistent with the previous uh, part of her testimony where she says, I don't remember what he said. And then suddenly she remembers very vividly, vividly what he said, uh, seemingly without prompting. And so uh, it seems like it, it's a possibility uh, uh, that she could be maybe um, coming up with this information spontaneously in order to create a perception to the listener. Susan? Yes, and then her shoulders come in and she loses, loses her confidence. So when a person does that, she's kind of come small, which you would think that could be associated with, with what this actually occurred. She's saying that it did. But the fact that she lost her confidence really quick, and then she also shows anger in her mouth. And we often see that her lips will become more pressed when she's saying he's, he's gonna, says he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. But it's just not consistent with what she says. I mean, the bottle, she said, was pressed up against her pelvic bone or her pubic bone and then it was causing this pressure but she doesn't move her gestures you don't see her gesturing with her words to make the story complete it's like a mime a mime should be able to and the body naturally does it when you're telling a story that's truthful everything goes in sync and this was it's not in sync so in my opinion it didn't happen the way she said it happened she's adding additional information or leaving out critical information. Um, and, and I wanted to follow up on that because that seems to be a theme here, right? That there, there's, there's, is it, is this, 
a potential for exaggeration? Is it a potential for changing the circumstances and everyone's role in what's happening? Because uh, for jurors, I think it's going to be significant to understand, well, abuse is abuse, whether it's to the level that she's saying or, or something less. Um, so mm -hmm. could you clarify that just a little bit, Susan? Yeah, so one of the things that I want to explain to you is that she was diagnosed by one of the experts with border, borderline personality disorder and also the histrionic personality disorder. Those specific disorders show that what the characteristics of how she's explaining things are in sync with what those illnesses are. So when she's explaining this, the natural tendency is to exaggerate because it's, it's very attention seeking. Her, she's in performance. So she wants to really get uh, people on board with her to see her side of it. But the problem is it's so far out there her emotions are so far in the extreme that it loses every bit of the credibility. So to your point, Vinny, no, I do not believe that the bottle was pressed up against her pelvic and that he was inserting it or abusing her with it. No, I do not. Okay, we've got a lot more to get to. We're doing this the whole hour, folks. Uh, Susan Constantine, Lieutenant Robert Schaefer, Jerry Crotty staying with us when we return. We're gonna talk about Johnny Depp's finger. And in there, there are two completely different stories. Which one um, is more credible, Johnny Depp's version or Amber Heard's? We'll find out when we return. and escalated and it turned into uh, madness. She was irate. She, she, she was irate and she was possessed. She, she, she walked up to me and reached and grabbed the, the bottle of vodka and then just uh, kind of stood back and hurled it. I felt heat look down and the tip of my finger had been severed and I knew in my mind and in my heart this is this is not life Johnny Depp describing uh, how he severed his finger that's his side of the story uh, this hour we're taking a look at the statements of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and trying to figure out if anyone is being deceptive, we've got our own team of uh, deception detectors with us. Susan Constantine, uh, jury consultant, human behavior expert, Lieutenant Robert Schaefer, statement analyst expert, and voice stress analyst expert, Jerry Crotty. Let's go now. Johnny Depp, once again, explaining to this jury how his finger was severed. And my, my hand is on the edge of the the bar like like that you know leaning over the fingers like that and uh, she threw the large bottle and it made contact and shattered uh, everywhere and I, I honestly didn't I didn't feel the pain at first at all I felt no pain whatsoever what I felt was, um, I felt heat. I felt heat and I felt um, as if something were dripping down my hand, you know. Um, and then I looked down and realized that the, the, the tip of my finger had been severed. Okay, Jerry Crotty, want to begin with you, voice stress analyst, expert. Um, what does that reveal? Anything here? Yes, uh, when Johnny Depp is speaking, um, there's, you know, there's no stress involved with anything except for two words, and that's when he said shattered everywhere. Um, that might have been just the way he was trying to describe it, uh, and, and that's how it came out. So essentially, sometimes what we see with voice stress is that sometimes when the human brain slows down and tries to figure out some words, we'll see a little bit of stress um, with that. But as he goes through his entire statement, 
Uh, actually, the voice is actually performing as it should. There's no stress associated with anything he's saying uh, until he gets to the part where he talks about how it had shattered everywhere, and then all of a sudden there's this extreme amount of stress, and then after that it goes right away. Um, if you were to ask me, uh, my opinion is he's telling the truth. Lieutenant Robert Schaefer, what do you think about, uh, you analyze the statement here, what, what would you come up with here? This was a difficult uh a portion to analyze because I had to take into consideration that um, he's been telling this story for years and uh, uh, there's a lot of coaching that's involved. There's a lot of um, teaching him how to tell a story and trying to cut through that uh, is, is difficult. Um, we do best, I do best, an analyst does when we get that story fresh out of their mind right after the incident happens. Uh, the um, all the other indicators would suggest that his story is from memory and that he is accurately recalling the story from memory and not altering that memory uh, in order to mislead the reader. I he had the impression there was a little bit of uh, uh, he sensationalized things a little bit. I actually looked at the entire uh, portion of that testimony, not just that uh, clip that you showed there. And when we show or we see the extended one, um, there's a lot of other indicators that he is uh, recalling from memory and uh, um, that uh, his story is generally truthful. There is some a little bit of embellishment, some exaggeration, and sens uh, sensationalizing some things, but his story is generally reliable. Susan Constantine, mm -hmm. what did you see from Johnny Depp in, in, in recalling how his finger was severed? Yes, and so kind of to speak to what Jerry and um, Bob are talking about too, when he's talking about memory, you know, people are telling the truth when they are talking about something that is in the past. They bring the past forward. When they start to speak in present tense, we know that there's embellishment. And here's the other things. Everybody lies, Vinny. Everyone does. So in this case, they exaggerate a little bit, kind of goes off the scales and it comes back. But overall, the entire statement, in my opinion, was truthful. So what I'm watching is body language which he's illustrating about this bottle and it's being flung at him. He's actually making the gestures and he's moving exactly in sync with the words. So what I'm looking at is, is he punctuating those words on point? Is he punctuating on syllable? And is his body language following the same pattern and movement as his words? And yes, I found that it was uh, truthful. And to the point of shattered, uh, shattered can be big here, but he does become more grandiose. So the bigger and wider the gestures, the larger and bigger and more grandiose it becomes. Here's Amber Heard talking about the same finger. He's standing at the office desk. He had his hand wrapped in this, uh, like, rags or you know bandana rags and I, I I think he took them down or somehow showed me and he said look what you made me do I did this for you something to that effect and I kind of put together it was covered in paint and I put together that that's like he was using his finger I quickly became aware that that's what he was using as a paintbrush, even though there was lots of paintbrushes around. Um, and we didn't have any sort of like coherent conversation, as you can imagine. Um, I figured out he was missing a finger. He kind of held it up, and I said, "What did you do? When? Like, what? What did you do? When?" And I realized in my head that there had been many hours since this probably happened. Assuming that that was the happened with the phone. Uh, in any case, I I knew it had been way too long that he had had this blood, you know, that he was bleeding, and I, I said, I'm going to call 911 if you don't call Jerry now. Uh, I don't. I still don't recall which of us um, called Jerry Judge, his security. All right, let's take this one around the horn. Susan? Oh, you know, I thought of like the O.J. Simpson case was like, here's the glove. Here it is. You know, she says that he was barely showing it, but she puts her hands up here. There are multiple indicators that she was being deceptive. Lieutenant Robert Schaefer. I got 
mixed messages with this this one. Uh, the she had a lot of specific verbal communication going on. She said this, he said that, and that's uh, that kind of communication makes up about ten percent of a person's story. Ninety percent is what happened, what they saw. Ten percent is what they heard. And so when, uh, contrary to what she did with the last uh, segment, where there was none, she actually offered quite a bit in this one. However, she um, uh, she had made one, what I would consider a fatal flaw when it comes to uh, deception, and that is she used the word we. And not to get into the weeds into this too much, but your subconscious reserves the word we uh, for good circumstances. We is, is considered when your, your mind is, is selecting the words for your mouth to speak, uh, it picks the right word for the situation. And the word we means, uh, from a statement analysis perspective, uh, a good, close relation, uh, relationship, willing participants, and generally a positive atmosphere. So when she said the word we, that's misused. It's not coming from memory. It's coming from some other source of information. And in, in the statement uh, analyst world, that's a fatal flaw. And so uh, that sinks her ship right there. Did Jerry Crotty, any stress on the voice? Yeah, I can tell you that they have a lot of paintbrushes. Other than that, after that, it pretty much goes downhill from there. So, uh, yes, there's a lot of stress in that statement that uh, she's probably sprinkling in a little bit of the truth, and she's also embellishing it, and she's also just mm -hmm. making it up as she goes. Mm -hmm. All right, our experts staying with us. Uh, when we come back, two more of Amber Heard's allegations, the slap and the headbutt. Don't go anywhere. He sits down in front of me at one point, and because I'm not answering him, I was looking out of the window, and he slaps my face. And his friend is in our proximity. And I, it didn't hurt me, it didn't hurt my face, it just felt embarrassed that he would do that to me in front of people. It was the first time that anything like that had happened in front of somebody. As I'm walking away, slowly trying not to be, I was being very deliberate about my movements, wasn't saying anything, I wasn't engaging. I am walking away from him slowly and he tells me to hurry the f up. Hurry up. And I just look at him one more time, wanting to penetrate the monster to see the man that I love underneath that. The man I loved. And he tells me to hurry up again and I pull my gaze away from him. I walk away from him. My back is turned to him and I feel this boot in my back. He just kicked me in the back. I fell to the floor, I caught myself on the floor and I just felt like I was looking at the floor of the plane for felt like a long time. Heard, Amber Heard describing the first time that she is assaulted in front of anyone. It was on the plane. Let's bring back in our deception detectors. Uh, Susan Constantine, uh, what do you see? What do you hear in, in this part of her testimony? So what I'm watching here is she's first, she's talking about that she's she is now face to face with Johnny. Johnny, or she's looking out the window. She doesn't turn her head as if she's turning, looking out the window, but she says that he slaps her. But he does, she doesn't use a gesture that she's being slapped. So that part of it is incongruent. Uh, the other parts, what I wanna share with you is you see a lot of disgust and scorn. That's very consistent with someone that has a histrionic personality disorder. In fact, they show a lot of anger, scorn, and disgust all together, and disgust being the strongest one. But the other part of it is too that she says that she felt a boot. Now, when she says that, she says a boot, which is very pungent, but she says felt, which is not incongruent with boot it's the opposite strong strength but it's just a feeling and then all of a sudden she she questions herself 
that whether this was a boot and she ended up on the floor. There's all kinds of information here that you know you put yourself in that situation where if you were there, what would your body be doing if somebody kicked you in the back? You would be flying on the floor and she never talks about what she hit anything, it was her face bruised or whatever. So again, here we are talking about a situation that probably occurred that she was looking out the window. We don't know whether he slapped her because he doesn't show the slapping effect. And also the other part of the boot, there's no action. There's no movement in her body when she's describing it. So that's incongruent. Jerry Crotty, anything in the voice? Yes, uh, so she's talking about the slap on the plane. Um, it starts out really well. Uh, she's, you know, there's no stress associated with any of this. Uh, then she starts to build up to the slap. That's when you start to see a little bit of stress. Um, you know, is it enough to like say that there's something there? Uh, not necessarily, there is some stress. It could just be from the situation that caused it. Uh, however, when I get down to the boot uh, incident, that uh, that is showing up on the on the uh, charts uh, very clearly that uh, that that incident on, on the word boot. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I've only seen one other chart look like that uh, when someone is being uh, deceptive. Uh, and so uh, at that area there, there's where she starts to really start to fall apart uh, based on her stress from the voice. Uh, Lieutenant Robert Schaefer. Yeah, lots of problems with this uh, portion of her testimony. And the, the biggest one is uh, uh, the, when she describes the violent acts, the, um, the slaps and the booting and the kicking, she tells it in present tense. And that's significant because that's when your, uh, when your rem memory releases information, when you're telling the story, it's always told in past tense. It's an event that happened in the past. So when she tells those portions of her story in the present tense, it means it's not coming from memory. It's being generated from some other source. It is a, a very serious lack of, uh, of, of um, confidence we have in that information. Let's get to one more statement by Amber Heard, an allegation of being head-butted in the face. Let's take a listen. I remember Johnny um, asking me if I wanted to go. And he did that thing where he's like, challenge, like challenging me, he said it in that way, challenging me to stand up and get back up. And when I did, he said, oh, you really want to go now, tough guy? Shut me back down. Oh, you really want to go, huh? Oh, you're so tough. I stood back up again. This time he hits me in the face. I stand back up and look him right in the eyes. And it was just a really still moment. I'll never forget it. Really still. I stood up and he said, do you want to go again, tough guy? And I just looked right at him, just looked right at his face. And he balled up his fists, leaned back, and headbutted me square in the nose, just right as I stood in front of him. All right, Susan, she's, she did the headbutt. Yes. Is that good? Yep, she did. Yes, now that ass actually is good. She actually leaned back. The forceful of it shows that there was some sort of action that occurred. And then she does a grooming gesture. So she kind of takes her hand and she touches her hair, which makes her feel a little bit uncomfortable. But then she talks about um, that, you know, when he's on top of her, he's grabbing her hair. There's no movement with it. Again, he's not grabbing my hair. He's not pulling me along. He's not dragging me along. None of those things, again, are congruent. So I know when I'm listening to this, I think there's some truth to this. Okay, when we come back, Johnny Depp, is he being deceptive? We'll take a look and a listen to a couple of his statements. Don't go away. The characterization of my substance, quote unquote, substance abuse um, that's been delivered by uh, Ms. Heard is, is 
is is is is grossly embellished um and i'm sorry to say but um a lot of it is um uh, it's just plainly false this is such an important issue here because really the allegations by Amber Heard is that when Johnny Depp is, is under the influence, that's when he does things. He doesn't remember them. He's so far gone. So let's listen to Johnny Depp here talk about his substance abuse issue, and then we'll bring back in our deception detectors. There's been no abuse of substances on film sets. There have been no uh, there's been no there's been no moments where I would have been considered out of control never in fact it's not been mentioned that I'm sure they don't want to mention it but I remember that because we when I was with Ms. Heard um, and her friends and we were all drinking wine um, and I smoking um, marijuana, um, they, would, they used to tease me because, the, because of uh, what they said was a, a, a ludicrous tolerance because I because I never appeared loaded or high. Okay, let's bring back in our deception detectors, Susan Constantine, Lieutenant Robert Schaefer, <clears throat> Jerry Crotty. Uh, Lieutenant, what do you think? I think he's lying. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, they might disagree with me, but uh, here's why. From a language perspective uh, specifically, he said uh, there was no abuse of substances on the film set. That's passive language, and it is completely unreliable. Um, he uh, uh, and most of this testimony revolves around his definition of the word abuse. I'm sure he doesn't view it as abuse. Uh, that's his maybe his way of life, and and maybe he's in total denial. But it uh, it's his definition of of what is abuse that um, uh, makes him able to tell a technical truth. It's true by his definition, but probably not by other people's. Jerry, how about his voice? A little stress? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, the CVSA uh, kind of works off the inception that the brain was built for survival and not to tell the truth or anything. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to watch the patterns as they work their way through his statement. Uh, he starts out very stressed out, trying to figure out which words to use. You can also hear him stumbling in the beginning. Uh, and then all of a sudden, when he gets to the substance, he starts to rationalize it. And he starts to basically uh, use terms of like, well, it's not of use to me. Uh, that's, that's exactly what he's trying to say. And then as you watch the patterns go through, uh, you see the, the stress go up and down. Because as he uh, starts out, he doesn't know how to answer that question. And he's very stressed about it. And then as he starts to rationalize, you start to see the, dre the, the stress begin to dissipate on his, uh, on his story. All right, let's get to the final statement. This is a, a big one because this is really what um, the whole case is about. Um, Johnny Depp, does he ever strike Amber Heard? Let's listen. There were um, arguments and um, things of that nature, but never did I myself r reach the point of um, uh, striking Miss Heard in any way, nor have I ever struck uh, um, any woman um, in my life. Susan Constantine, I'll begin with you. Mm. You know, watching that is really painful because he's really uncomfortable. You almost kind of see him. He's got almost like a stiff neck when he's looking around. And he's really feeling a lot of internal anxiety when he's walking through this. And there has been altercations. I believe there has been. 
to what degree, it's uncertain. But I can tell you, watching his body language there with his facial expressions, his uneasiness, his stressors in his forehead, he's looking over to the the way he's looking at the jury, something occurred, whether it was an all in all fight, but definitely there is some background here. Lieutenant? Yeah, he is Jody Arias Itis in this uh, segment here. He. Anytime you use this many words to say something you could have said in this many words, it's significant. He goes on and on and on uh, when all you needed to say was, I didn't ever strike Amber. Um, and again, we get back to word definitions. What does he mean by strike? There's lots of words he could have used and he could be rationalizing this in his mind that what he did uh, doesn't qualify. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's another video clip uh, out there uh, where he's talking about, hey, I didn't, uh, I didn't punch you, I hit you. He himself uh, uses definitions to rationalize his, uh, his behavior. Yeah, so, I, I think that, that audio you're referring to though is actually her. That's Amber Heard saying, uh, and okay. they're, having, they're having the whole conversation back and forth. Okay, Jerry Crotty, how's his voice in the in in, in this part where he's saying, I did not hit Amber Heard. I have never hit any woman in, in the world. I think it would have been better if he would have chose the word hit instead of strike because uh, when you look at the stress that he's anticipating the word, uh, you can tell that he rationalizes that again. And, and basically what I'm looking for is the stress uh, builds throughout the statement until he gets to the point. He has this, this kind of weird long pause uh, trying to figure out how to uh, say this without coming off as he's actually hit her. Um, and so he uses the word strike. And in uh, and, and both times he used the word strike striking and struck and both of those words uh caused a lot of stress uh in his in his uh statement um, but you do see it build throughout up to that point uh and then it kind of dissipates a little bit as he's trying to figure out the word and then all of a sudden if he gets to the word it still bothers him that he has to use that word fascinating hour susan constantine <laughs> lieutenant robert schaefer jerry crowdy thank you so much um, for, for joining us tonight. Your time is, is valuable. Your insight is incredible. Um, we'll see you again real soon. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, folks, when we come back um, next week, Monday, back on the stand. Amber Heard will be back on the stand and eventually facing cross-examination. Could happen as early as Monday afternoon. What is that going to look like? What is that going to sound like? Will it look anything like her deposition? Think Tank, next.